I'm Nick Galway from GlaxoSmith Klein, and I'm chairing the session. And I'm going to start with five minutes of background, which uh, may be familiar to some of you, but perhaps not all. Uh, we have three speakers, uh, Heather Cordell, Cordell, uh, Toby Johnson, and Luke Justins, who will, roughly speaking, be talking about the past, the present, and the future of the fruitful relationship. A bit of background. Here is where the relationship started, in the garden of the Abbey of St. Thomas, in the suburb of Bruno, which is now in the Czech Republic. And here's the man who started it, Gregor Mendel, a monk in the Abbey. And here's what he found, that if you cross a true-breeding red-flowered line of peas with a true-breeding white-flowered line, the white trait completely disappears in the first hybrid generation, and then reappears in the second generation undiluted in the characteristic ratio, the famous ratio of three to one. And he postulated that there is some kind of particle that is passing unchanged through the generations, what we now call the gene. And he went on to consider what if you'd have not just one trait, but say three traits, A, B, C, here in his handwriting, and he considered the ratios that you would get of all the possible combinations of A, B, and C, so already it's getting quite statistical. This he did in 1865, and the work was more or less forgotten until it was rediscovered independently three times in 1900. But I think there's no reason to assume that he died a disappointed man. He rose to be the abbot of the monastery, and he is said to have said, my day will come. But when it was rediscovered, the biometricians objected that this particular thing was not what you usually saw. You usually saw that the um, average of the parents was what you got in the offspring. So you had uh, parental value on the horizontal axis, offspring value on the vertical axis. So you had some continuous variation and apparent blending of the parental characteristics. It wasn't until 1918 that R.A. Fisher, in his paper, The Correlation Between Relatives on the Supposition of Mendelian Inheritance, reconciled the particulate and the blending um, theories and also combined genetics and statistics, and they've remained closely related to each other ever since. Okay, Heather will now take up the story. She's Professor of Statistical Genetics at Newcastle University, and the research interests of her group are the development and application of statistical methodologies to the genetic study of complex disease. And she'll talk about the history of the relationship between the two disciplines. So welcome, Heather. So as Nick mentioned, uh, if you think about uh, statistics and genetics and the relationship between them, the first person you'd think of is uh, R.A. Fisher. My own connection with R.A. Fisher, or knowledge of R.A. Fisher, started back in 1995. Um, three of his papers make an appearance in my own PhD thesis. Um, however, it has to be said that uh, they weren't a heavy influence on the work in the PhD thesis. They really came into the introduction, um, and so they, they had an indirect influence on the work I was doing, but not really a, a very direct in influence. Um, however, the area of, uh, that I've worked in that has been more directly influenced by R.A. Fisher is the area of epistasis, or gene-gene interaction, and uh, I'll come back to that later in the talk. Um, on a more personal note, I did my postdoc uh, with Robert Elston at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And Robert had actually studied in Cambridge uh, when R.A. Fisher was a lecturer there. So he'd had some lectures from R.A. Fisher, and he had considered uh, staying on uh, to do part <coughs> two in genetics, which basically would have meant working with R.A. Fisher as a research student. And, um, He's written a nice piece for the journal Genetic Epidemiology, his sort of reminiscence of, of R.A. Fisher in celebration of his 1918 uh, paper, which is, has its centenary, of course, this year. Um, so when he asked his tutor about whether he should do this, uh, apparently uh, the tutor replied, the Department of Genetics at Cambridge is rather new. This man, Fisher, is considered to be eccentric by some, so it may not stand you in good stead in later life for it to be known that you have worked with him. 
So uh, Robert chose not to work with Ari Fisher. I don't know that it did him any great harm. He had a very illustrious career himself. Uh, but it's interesting that the view of Ari Fisher, at least at this time, was perhaps slightly different uh, from the view that we have now. Uh, finally, on an even more personal note, um, I was on a ski trip um, about 10 years ago, and it turned out that uh, three of the other people on the ski trip were the grandsons of R.A. Fisher. Uh, when we started introducing ourselves on the first day, I was very excited about this. I think I was probably the only person on the ski trip who thought this was an exciting thing. Uh, but anyway, they, they were pleased that I was impressed by their connection. Okay, but of course the, the uh, history of the relationship between genetic and statistics is about much more than R.A. Fisher. And when I was thinking about how to uh, look at the relationship, I thought, well, what I should do is look at the history of the two disciplines separately and see where I could find some areas of commonality or areas of intersection. Uh, so first of all, thinking about the history of statistics, um, there's a nice poster that was available for, from the Significance magazine, uh, I think last year, which gives uh, essentially the timeline of statistics. You won't be able to see it at this resolution, uh, but if you get, uh, in fact, you can hardly see it if you get the kind of uh, the magazine, it's very small, but if you get the full uh, poster, which some of you might have um, pinned up in your stats departments, uh, then you get a, a nice uh, overview of at least uh, what the people who produced the poster thought was, was a, a history of statistics uh, through the years. So if we focus on a few selected uh, items, um, so back in 1761, uh, we've got a mention of Thomas Bayes and the start of Bayes' theorem. Now, of course, this is not directly anything to do with genetics, but it's been such an important part of genetics that I thought it was worth um, kind of highlighting this as uh, one of the important areas. We also um, have, uh, in 1808, Gauss and uh, basically the derivation of the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve, uh, which again, of course, is, is not only used in genetics, it's used in all the statistics, but again, it's such a fun fundamental part of genetics that um, I thought I would highlight it. And then, uh, perhaps, uh, some things that have more direct relationship, we've got measure, uh, mentions of Carl Pearson and Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin, um, who, who did genuinely uh, do work that was very much influenced by uh, genetics and the thinking about genetics. And then finally, in 1935, we've got a uh, mention of R.A. Fisher himself. Although it doesn't really mention any of his work in genetics, it mentions his other seminal work in statistics. So clearly there are some uh, characters who worked in genetics um, who, who are being very much uh, recognized as being important people in the history of statistics. And again, if you do a, a search on the web um, and look on Wikipedia, you find uh, a number of the same people being mentioned as, as seminal statisticians um, who we also know from their other work, work was that their, their statistical work was very much influenced by their interest in genetics. Uh, what about if you do the search the other way around, if you think about the history of genetics? Um, well, I find this quite interesting. Um, not all of what you get is particularly statistical. Um, it turns out genetics dates back from much earlier than I had thought. Um, there, there was uh, a lot of thinking about uh, genetics in the classical era. Uh, including some ideas about uh, hereditary, mater hereditary material uh, being transmitted through semen, the fact that uh, both males and females contribute, the fact that there are dominant and recessive types of inheritance, and the fact that there is um, essentially independent assortment of these sperm atoms, these things that, that, that are being produced uh, that are, uh, are, uh, are causing the, the hereditary uh, material. So I think that's just very interesting that um, so, so early on, uh, the thinking, uh, presumably based on very little evidence, but based more on, on kind of uh, uh, just sort of mind experiments, uh, was coming up with ideas that actually are not so far from, from how we uh, believe um, genetics really works. But of course, modern genetics um, and the uh, real start of the relationship between genetics and statistics, as Nick mentioned, uh, dates from the, the work of Gregor uh, Mendel and his uh, famous paper about the um, plants. Uh, this, were, um, this showed that the, the traits in the plant did indeed obey simple statistical rules and uh, showed the dominant and recessive uh, ideas. Um, now, there was some debate about actually whether Mendel's um, experiments were, uh, the results were a bit too good to be true. Uh, it has been suggested that the actual patterns that, that you see are um, perhaps too closely related to, to uh, the, what, what they should be. And so Robert Elston, again, in his reminiscences about uh, R.A. Fisher, uh, says that, uh, at least as far as he was aware, Fisher never entertained the idea that Mendel had fudged his data to make the uh, calculations work out. Um, what what um, 
according to uh, Robert Elston, uh, he says that Fisher believed that Mendel had an assistant who knew what Mendel was looking for, and it was this assistant who uh, slightly tweaked the data uh, to please Mendel. So I don't know, I guess we're never going to know uh, really what happened there, but uh, that's sort of an interesting uh, note. Um, so Mendel's paper was published in a relatively obscure journal, and as Nick mentioned, it attracted really rather little attention at the time, and so the discussion in, in the field was rather focusing on this um, idea that's been called Lamarckian heredity or pangenesis, which is more of this idea of kind of blending of characteristics from parents um, to children, and also passing on characteristics that parents have actually acquired during their own lifetime to the children. Um, however, Francis Galton rejected this idea, and um, he's really the person that's been credited with uh, the more biometric statistical approach um, which, e even though in a sense it, it, Im it involves blending in the sense of continuous uh, traits, it's really a kind of mathematical um, sort of blending. And Francis Galton ha is, is uh, credited with really establishing some very key statistical techniques like correlation, regression, regression to the mean, um, that, that form the basis of this biometric approach. But I would say these are now considered es essential statistical tools, and it's interesting that these essential statistical tools really had their origin in application to ideas in genetics. Another key figure at this time um, was uh, someone called Raphael Weldon, um, and he started using the statistical techniques that Francis Gordon had developed, um, taking the view that the problem of animal evolution is essentially a statistical problem. Um, and so uh, but the, work, the work of, of Raphael Weldon and working with Carl Pearson and um, various others um, really led to a Royal Society Committee uh, trying to investigate really what, what the approach, best approach would be for investigating these sorts of problems. Uh, and uh, in, in the paper that they wrote, they remarked that the, the questions raised by the Darwinian hypothesis are purely statistical, and the statistical method is the only one at present obvious by which that hypothesis can be experimentally checked. So I think it's clear that um, people working in genetics at this time um, could see that uh, there, there was an intimate relationship with statistics and it wasn't going to be possible to make any progress without <coughs> actually uh, using statistical methods. And now again, as Nick mentioned, uh, Mendel's work was uh, re-derived or rediscovered um, in the early uh, 1900s and also extensions of, of it, uh, uh, particularly the extension to non-independent assortment known as linkage, whereby um, the, the alleles, which we now know is what's being transmitted, um, actually if they're close together, they tend to get transmitted together rather than being transmitted independently from parents to children. Uh, that idea uh, came about. Um, however, this rediscovery of the work uh, precipitated the conflict that Nick also mentioned uh, with uh, Weldon and Pearson on one side and Bateson and Dupree's on the other. Um, the, the controversy really being whether in fact um, you, you did have um, genes whose alleles segregated discreetly, like uh, we saw with Mendel's uh, sweet peas, or whether this variation was continuous uh, and not discrete, which is what seemed to be the case if you actually measured quantitative traits. Um, and again, as Nick mentioned, this controversy was effectively resolved by uh, R.A. Fisher's 1918 uh, paper. Um, now, it has been suggested that actually Fisher had resolved the problem a little bit earlier than the paper, also, there's some suggestion that he wasn't the only person who came up with this resolution. There were others uh, around the time um, having similar ideas. Uh, but certainly, I, I would say that Fisher's 1918 paper is the one that's really credited for, for solving the, the issue. And really showing how, how mathematically continuous variation could indeed result from a number of discrete genetic loci. That was a key thing. It wasn't just a single locus that was segregating. It was a lot of them. And when, when you have them all kind of segregating with their various probabilities, that ends up uh, inducing a continuous distribution of the traits. And then in a subsequent series of papers, they, they showed how Mendelian genetics was consistent with um, evolution driven by natural selection. OK, um, so uh, that's the history of genetics, if you like, or early genetics. What about molecular genetics? Um, I'm not going to spend it very long on these next two slides, because apart from the fact they've just got a lot of words on them, there's actually not much, not much statistics um, in the early history of molecular genetics. Um, of course, uh, the important thing in molecular genetics is the sort of clarification of the structure of DNA and the relationship between DNA and RNA and protein. Um, and I think it's very interesting that this early work so all of this stuff that was happening in the sort of early 1900s, um, maybe up to about 1930, 
didn't require you to know anything about the structure of DNA, anything about what genes were, a genome sequence. Um, actually, uh, all of this stuff basically could, could, be, um, could be derived by just reasoning that there was some character that was passed in some way from parents to children. And as a statistician, I, I quite like that because I can understand that and I can write down uh, probabilistic rules for that. Uh, whereas it gets much more complicated when you actually start thinking about, if you like, genomics and what's become the basis of, of modern bioinformatics and genomics, which is, uh, requires a much uh, deeper understanding of the structure of DNA and, and the uh, kind of mechanism by, work, by which the DNA then leads to characters. Okay, so I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time now just uh, highlighting a few particular areas where I think there's been a particularly fruitful relationship between genetics and statistics. And the first area is population genetics, and in particular, the Wright-Fisher model. So the Wright-Fisher model um, is a model that's used in population genetics to describe the evolution over time of the count of one of the possible alleles at a genetic locus. Um, now, it makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes no selection, no mutation, no migration, uh, non-overlapping generations, random mating. But in spite of these assumptions, it's actually proved a, a very kind of fruitful and useful uh, model. So, if we let uh, big A and little a denote the two alleles that segregate at a locus in a population, and if we denote the count of the big A as xt, um, then we can model xt as a discrete time Markov chain. So it's clearly just a statistical model for, for what's happening. And if you um, say that you've got binomial sampling of the alleles at each generation, then that allows you to write the transition matrix for the Markov chain as shown here. And so again, we can see this is basically just a mathematical model. Um, you know, but what exactly these things that are being passed down is, is somewhat irrelevant to the statistical treatment. Um, but it's still a commonly used model. I was lucky enough to um, go to a Beers workshop last month uh, in Banff in Canada, and there was a nice talk there by Simon Gravel, who, ex who, who was extending the MS Prime software to use the right Fisher model rather than what it currently uses, which is an approximation to the coalescent. And, so, and, and apparently that gave it some nice properties. So I think it's interesting that this sort of very simple and, and clearly not entirely correct model actually is still very useful. That brings us on to the coalescent, which is another uh, popular model in population genetics. And uh, this is primarily attributed to John Kingman. Uh, in the simplest case, again, it makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes no recombination, no natural selection, no gene flow or population structure. Uh, some of these assumptions have been relaxed in, uh, in various uh, papers. So the, the clever thing about the coalescent is that it tries to model the ancestry of alleles at a genetic locus backwards in time, which is the, the kind of novel idea. So where the lineages coalesce in their most recent common ancestor. So it's sometimes uh, sort of shown in a figure a bit like this. So here we've got the present at the top and the past at the bottom. And so the idea is we've got all these alleles um, that are uh, sort of segregating in the population. Um, but if what we're interested in in the present is these, uh, these alleles that are noted in, in yellow, then really all we need to know is how they uh, were modeled backwards. We don't need to worry about all the ones in blue that never made it into the present generation or the present generation that we're interested in. Um, you sometimes see it written the other way around. So here we've got the present at the bottom and here we've got the past at the top. And we've got the most recent <coughs> common ancestor of uh, these uh, individuals here at the bottom and we've got them kind of going back and then we've also got mutations uh, potentially put on the, on the grid. So anyway, I think you can see from even just looking at the, at the diagrams that this is fundamentally a mathematical or statistical model. Um, again, we don't really need to understand very much about what these uh, alleles are. And it's been extremely useful in population and evolutionary genetics for modeling evolutionary relationships between and within species. It's also been quite useful in my own area of more kind of disease-based genetics in terms of trying to model uh, the evolution of disease alleles. Okay, the other area I said I would uh, try and touch on at least briefly is epistasis or gene-gene interaction. Um, so it, it's, it's often defined as interaction between genetic factors, but the trouble is what's actually meant by interaction and therefore what's meant by epistasis is not always uh, clear. And a key issue is trying to define what exactly you mean by the effect of a genetic factor and what you mean by the independence of those effects with departure from independence of those effects uh, being denoted as interaction. So there's a very helpful paper uh, by Phillips from about 10 years ago who, who defines three different types of epistasis, compositional, statistical, and functional, and really points out that even though they, these have got the same name, 
uh, they're, they're three different concepts and, and you need to think of them differently. So statistical uh, epistasis is really um, what I would say, uh, the kind of most natural thing you would think, uh, it, it's a sort of standard uh, definition term in terms of interaction terms in a linear model. So if we've got a linear model for some outcome y, and we're trying to look at the main effects of two predictors, xd and xc, then uh, basically statistical epistasis is, is the existence of this interaction term in the linear model. Um, Note that the presence or absence of the interaction is going to depend on the scale chosen. So it depends on what function you're actually using for your outcome. And that leads to, to the idea of uh, interaction effects only really relating on a particular scale. So it depends how your effects are being defined. Now, Fisher, in his 1918 paper, used the terms epistasy and epistatic to define, apparently, this concept. Unfortunately, Bateson, a few years earlier, had already used the term interaction and epistatic to define a different concept, uh, which I would say corresponds to the compositional epistasis uh, that, that Phillips mentions. So Bateson's concept is more about having one factor that allows or prevents another one from having its in effect. Uh, and it's perhaps best seen uh, by this example here. So this is supposed to represent the coat color in mice according to uh, what your alleles are at two different loci. Uh, there's a locus B and there's a locus C. And the idea is that if you don't have any big B or any big C alleles, then your coat color is white. Uh, if you have a big C allele, that turns your coat color brown. If you have a big B allele, that turns your coat color black. However, if you have both the big B allele and the big C allele, it's the big C allele that takes precedence. And so you end up with the color that goes with the big C allele, not the color that goes with the big B allele. So this is a kind of um, uh, an effect whereby the, the big C allele sort of prevents the big B allele from having its effect. So it's, uh, it's a sort of well-defined concept, and uh, apparently this is how coat color works in, in certain uh, animals. But it's not really the same as a statistical interaction term in a linear model. And so using the same word for it is arguably uh, quite confusing. And subsequently, this, this same term, epistasis, has been used for a number of quite different concepts. And uh, you could perhaps argue this is more of an example of an unfruitful relationship between genetics and statistics, uh, because it's often made the literature quite confusing. OK, I'm going to just uh, finish off um, by a, a couple of slides on what I would call more recent influences. But I know that my future speaker, the future speakers are going to be covering uh, much more on that. So first of all, um, I thought, what have been the more recent influences of statistics on genetics? Well, of course, in genetics, uh, we now um, have, have uh, molecular markers. We now have the ability to generate genotype data. And of course, that has um, really changed things a lot from uh, Fisher's time, uh, because it's allowed researchers to use what you might call very standard statistical methods, as well as advanced statistical methods to analyze this data. And so this includes things like linkage analysis that makes use of likelihood-based techniques and sequential testing techniques, uh, and things like random effects models, and association analysis, including genome-wide association studies, which often make a lot of use of um, standard techniques like generalized linear models, uh, linear and logistic regression in particular, mixed effects models, uh, Bayesian approaches, machine learning approaches. There's also computational methods like um, REML that have been particularly useful for fitting models that incorporate the special correlation structures you get when you're thinking about genetics and you've got pedigree data or family data, people that are related to one another. So these are uh, all kind of areas of statistics that have been particularly useful in genetics. You could argue they've been useful in many other scientific disciplines. They're not only used in genetics, uh, but they have been particularly important in genetics. Perhaps more interesting is whether there's actually been any influence um, more recently of genetics on statistics. And the two areas that I thought of um, where this uh, could be argued to be the case, this may not be exhaustive, is um, the area of ABC, Approximate Bayesian Computation, uh, which has been used a lot, very widely, in different areas of statistics. But actually, um, you could argue dates back to this paper um, by Simon Cabaret and colleagues uh, from Genetics, uh, where the idea was really inspired by its application to inferring coalescence times from DNA sequence data. So I would say this is an, uh, an area where genetics itself has actually influenced some, some developments in statistics. The other area is um, FDR, false discovery rate, um, which um, is really uh, was motivated by the multiple testing problem that's induced by many high throughput technologies. Um, so not limited to gene expression studies, but actually probably the, the main uh, types of data that have been used uh, for, for FDR is uh, gene expression uh, RNA levels. And so again, I think you could this is, argue this is an area where genetics or perhaps genomics 
has actually inspired development of new statistical So I'm going to talk really about one aspect of genetics and statistics in the sort of present day, um, and this isn't meant to imply that this is the only area of interest in genetics or statistics, but it is one of the most popular research areas, especially in terms of applications, and that's genome-wide association studies, and I'll just quickly remind you what those are as, as I start to talk about them. I'm going to talk about inferring causality, and in particular the way that the pharmaceutical industry is interested in inferring causality, why we're interested in inferring causality, how it's useful to us. Uh, strangely, I'm not going to talk at all about Mendelian randomization, which is what you might have expected from this title. Um, so it's 13 years since the first successful genome-wide association study, uh, which was a study in 2005. And I'm just going to talk through this very quickly so that everybody understands what, what the idea here is. So this was a study um, of one particular disease, which was age-related macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of blindness in the developed world. And in this study, they looked at a little over 100,000 genetic variants scattered across the genome. So what, I'm going to use this term variant extensively throughout my talk. It, it's a generalization of SNP, or, or several other terms you might have heard. Basically, it's a point in the human sequence. As we track along the sequence, most of it's invariant. It's the same in every individual, and as you track along every so often, every hundred letters or so, you get to a point where two individuals may differ and that's a variant. And in this particular example, it's on the first chromosome at this rather cryptic position, which is just how many letters along the sequence we've counted here, and you can either have a T or a C at that position. And in fact, because every individual um, has material they inherited from both their mother and their father, every individual can either have two Ts, one T and one C, or two Cs. Um, and so, so that's what a variant is. Uh, um, or what I'm going to call a variant. Um, and this study looked at 100,000 of those scattered across the genome, and they looked at what now seems like a very small number of human subjects, 146 of them, 96 of whom had AMD, and 50 who didn't, so they were the controls, and they just looked at this one disease. Uh, and um, the strongest association they found was at this exact position here on chromosome 1, it was a T to C change, and so each um, copy of the um, T that you have increases your odds of having AMD of the disease by um, 3.7. So that's quite a large increase in, in risk or odds. Um, there's quite a strong association p-value here if you test this using logistic regression or any other suitable method for a contingency table. And as uh, Xi Hong mentioned yesterday, one of the things that the genetics field got right very early on was recognizing the importance not only of stringent multiple testing adjustment in the so-called discovery study, but also then replicating that exact association with the exact same variant with the same or a very similar definition of disease in a completely independent replication cycle. Okay, so that's what they found in that very small um, in that in that very small study, and that was 13 years ago. Um, here's a sort of um, potted history of what's happened, and actually this is my sort of personal version of the history. So that study is in 2005. I got involved in this field in 2007 when I moved to Switzerland and started working on um, a data set called the cohort Les Anois, um, which was a little over 6,000 subjects who were all recruited from the Swiss city of Lausanne. Uh, this, I thought actually I was going to have an easy postdoc job and do a lot of skiing. Um, it turned out that there's quite a lot of data to work on. Um, um, so this study they've measured 500,000 genetic variants across the genome, and they've measured roughly 200 different what I'm going to call phenotypes, so those are diseases or other potentially medically relevant traits like blood pressure, cholesterol level, um, various other things you can either ask people about, do you have diabetes or things you can measure in their blood or urine. Uh, and on the basis of this, one study in 2005, <coughs> there was one science paper, I think we were expecting naive, we should write about 200 science and nature papers based on this data. Actually, we wrote none, um, because it turned out that age-related macular degeneration is quite unusual in that there's a genetic variant which has a very large effect on disease risk. And the vast majority of the phenotypes we've measured here, the genetic effects were much smaller and we were unable to discover, let alone replicate, any convincing association in this data set on its own. What we did do is collaborate with other groups all over the world who had similar data sets, uh, and this was part of a sort of emerging industry at the time of forming um, large consortia, and there were consortia forms to study basically every imaginable human disease and trait. I was involved in one of them that studied blood pressure. Um, so um, by 2009, 
we've assembled a sort of combined aggregate data set with information from over 34,000 individuals who were in 17 different cohorts like this cohort, Los Anuals. And we shared summary, extensive summaries of our data in all to, to enable us to meta-analyze those associations across um, and it effectively combine the information from that larger number of subjects. And we looked just at two phenotypes, which were systolic and diastolic blood pressure, they're the two numbers the doctor tells you, and you can blood pressure measured, and by its interval trick called imputation, where we took the known correlation structure between the genetic variants we'd actually measured and the ones that we knew were there that we hadn't measured, um, we were able to analyze two and a half million genetic variants. Uh, and this was one of the first studies to successfully discover genetic associations with blood pressure, which has been widely regarded as being intractable because it's a very noisy thing to measure. Um, fast forward another, well, seven years really, until the first UK biobank data was released into the public. This changes everything again. So by dint of this imputation trick again and the availability of better reference panels that describe the correlation structure between different genetic variants across the genome, we can now easily look at 200, uh, sorry, 20 million genetic variants across the genome. UK Biobank, it's hard to say how many phenotypes have been measured because there's very extensive questionnaire data. There's imaging data. One image on its own, if you count each pixel as a measurement, there's a, a huge number of phenotypes. And of course, you can derive other features from that imaging data. There's linkage to hospital admissions and there will be linkage to primary health care and prescription records. So, at a very, very conservative estimate, we think we've derived 5,000 meaningful phenotypes from this sort of semi-structured phenotypic data on the UK Biobank participants. And as Shihong mentioned yesterday, there's 500,000 subjects in UK Biobank. There are other biobanks apart from UK Biobank, and I wouldn't want to pretend that UK Biobank is the only one. UK Biobank is special because any bona fide researcher can get access to the complete data, the complete subject level data, for basically a nominal fee. And that's totally different to any other biobank I'm aware of. So, for, um, so, so that's what makes UK Biobank such a powerful research resource, and the number of different groups that are working on the data is, is orders of magnitude bigger than any other biobank. So just to put that in sort of graphical terms, what I've drawn here is a square which represents not the sample size of UK Biobank, that's the one axis I haven't drawn, um, but the number of genetic variants across the genome that you can look at, the number of phenotypes you can look at on that axis, and this big square here is UK Biobank. And if you just look at the, basically the correlation coefficients or some other regression statistic um, testing each phenotype for association with each genetic variant, you can have a matrix of 100 billion correlation coefficients or 100 billion regression coefficients. Um, and then if I draw those earlier studies, the 2005 age-related macular degeneration study, the CoLab study, or the blood pressure consortium right there, like here. So UK Biobank really does change the scale of everything that we can do. Um, so it seems like everything's expanding on every different axis, number of phenotypes, number of genetic variants, sample size. The one thing that hasn't changed is how we analyze the data at all. Um, so this is just, just to show you that UK Biobank does give us different Results, this is um, our own analysis. This is a particular measure of lung function. Um, it's called the FBD1 to FBC ratio. So that's the amount of air you can blow out in the first second of blowing out hard compared to the total amount of air you can blow out. If it's a low number, it, it suggests that your airways are constricted. So if I breathe out like this, I've probably got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If I can blow out like that, I've got healthy lungs. Um, and basically what I'm showing you here is the minus log chem p value, so some measure of association between that phenotype and the genetic variant at every position in the genome drawn out, arranged by the chromosomes, and this red dashed line here is our conventional multiple testing adjusted um, significance threshold. Um, so basically there is no problem with signal detection. There are lots and lots and lots of regions of the genome that are associated with lung function. If you zoom in, you find that in between all of these peaks here, there are also regions where there's no association. Uh, you just can't see them at this scale. But there are hundreds of distinct regions of the genome containing variants that are associated with lung function. So we can find lots of these things. And that's true for the majority of diseases and traits of interest. Uh, and, and how are we doing this? Well, this is the predominant or successful analysis method for GUS. We test association of each phenotype with each genetic variant individually using basically linear or logistic regression. If we're feeling really fancy, we might use a survival model or something like that. 
right? Uh, we might have a few covariates that go in, and basically we put this in a loop. So the loop goes around over each variant, and then there's another loop around that that goes over each phenotype. And then we do a couple of other not very fancy things, which is some sort of Bonferroni-like correction. And if you're feeling really, really ambitious, you might do some sort of simple forward stepwise model selection where you pick the variant with the smallest p-value, and then you include that as a covariate, and then you try and find another variant with the first variant as a covariate. And you might be thinking, I can think of a better way to analyse the data than that. And you wouldn't be the first person to think that, and you won't be the last person to think that. And I would say that roughly 99% of the activity that's gone on in statistical genetics to do with GWEF has involved thinking of and applying better methods of analysing the data. And I hope I won't offend anybody when I say that maybe 99% of the effort went into that and probably less than 1% of the actual biological understanding has come from those more sophisticated methods of analysis, putting multiple genetic variants into the model at once, um, assuming that the genetic effect might be different in people of different ages or different sexes, trying to model more phenotype in more complicated ways. None of it seems, and you know, I was involved in this for like years of my life, right? You know, sort of complicated models to do with non-normal distributions of blood pressure, trying to adjust for the treatment effect in sensible ways, because lots of people are taking medication when you, when you measure their blood pressure, and so on. And, and none of it really makes anywhere near as much difference as we always hope. Um, and that's not to say that all of that research enterprise has been worthless. I would say what it's taught us is that actually reality, or this aspect of reality is actually very simple and very similar to the assumptions that actually Fisher made in his 1918 paper that reconciled Mendelian inheritance with the biometric model. So Fisher, that, that paper was basically a limit theorem. It's assumed that if there are a large number of variants that affect the trait, and Mendelian inheritance applies independently at each one, and they all have small effects, and then you take a limit where the number of variants goes to infinity, and the effect size is equal <coughs> to zero at the same time such that the variance is constant, then you obtain the biometric rules of inheritance. And basically those assumptions that Fisher made in 1918 seem to hold up surprisingly well in reality a hundred years later. So that's kind of interesting. It's unclear whether, and there's a whole sort of sidetrack on the sort of Fisher worldview and the Sewell Wright worldview, it's a little bit unclear whether Fisher actually thought the world worked this way, or whether Fisher was making the assumptions that enabled him to prove the theorem that he wanted to prove. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he did make those assumptions 100 years ago, and they do seem to hold up in practice. Um, so, so that's basically how GWAS works. Uh, one of the interesting complications um, is genetic relatedness within samples. And um, really, the only thing that should be surprising about this is we got surprised by this. So that first study in 2005, 96 cases, not surprisingly, none of them were related to each other because they chose them to be unrelated. The 50 controls weren't related to each other, right? But if you sample 500,000 people from 10 recruiting centres in China or 500,000 people from slightly more recruiting centres in the UK, you end up with roughly 20% of your sample being first-degree relative pairs, often siblings. Um, in, in a similar study in China, it turned out there were whole families like queuing up at the recruiting centres together. You know, they've got successive um, subject ID numbers. Um, and, and obviously, if you sample the entire UK, there will be very, very few individuals in that sample who are not related to each other at all. Um, so, so, and the problem is that genetically related individuals are more similar to each other than randomly chosen pairs of people from the same population. And that basically means that all standard regression methods fail. And the reason for that is the phenotypes aren't IID conditional on the genetic variant you're analysing at the moment, right? They're more similar because of all of the other genetic variants that aren't in your model at the moment. Uh, and there's a, there's, it turns out there's a reasonably good solution to that, which is a linear mixed model. Uh, so basically you assume that the vector of phenotypes for all of the subjects you're analysing, so this is a 500,000 long vector of, say, lung function in UK Biobank, is normally distributed with um, a mean that contains your fixed effects, so there's an intercept and the genetic variant that you're interested in at the moment, the focal genetic variant, any covariate. And then there's a variance, which is just the sum of two terms, and this is just a normal mi linear mixed effects model written in a slightly funny way. Um, so there are two scalar variance components here, this genetic variance and this so-called environmental or non-genetic variance. And there's two covariance matrices. One is the matrix of pairwise relatednesses, so that's half for first degree relatives, um, siblings or parents, child, and an identity matrix for the, for the other half. Um, 
And, and, and interestingly, so, so the worldview you come to in genetics, most people actually haven't read Fisher's 1918 paper. They wouldn't be able to say what an infinitesimal model was, but they were implicitly assuming the, the same assumptions that Fisher made 100 years ago. This linear mixed model that we use to correct for related um, individuals in the analysis sample is making the same assumptions, but explicitly. And that's what gives rise to this, this ginormous normal distribution. This poses somewhat severe computational problems. So if you want to analyze one variant for one phenotype, you have to do a linear mixed model fit to 500,000 sample graph of data. Now do that 100 billion times, and um, you've got a fairly substantial computational task on your hands. Uh, even with most of the kind of tricks that we can think of, so obviously you do something with this big matrix, right? You don't use a standard linear mixed model fit every time you basically diagonalize this matrix first once. You've still got to diagonalize a 500,000 by 500,000 matrix. You can't even fit that in computer memory on most computer systems, right? We sort of conservatively estimate that it would take about four and a half years um, with all of the tricks we can think of on a 400 CPU cluster to analyze every variant against every phenotype in UK by bank this way. Uh, luckily, we have some very clever colleagues, our, our collaborators in Edinburgh, who are better at linear algebra than us and have access to a much bigger compute cluster. Uh, and so they've cranked through about 700 of the most important or relevant phenotypes um, using this approach. And then for the vast majority of other phenotypes, we're actually basically excluding about 20% of the sample. But the point I want to make is that as we move into this era of collecting data sets that are more and more of the population of a given country, um, these methods for dealing with relatedness and making them computationally tractable is going to be increasingly important. So, so the last thing I want to talk about very quickly is, is why we're interested in this. Okay, so, and this is to do with basically <coughs> predicting which drug discovery and development campaigns are likely to be, be successful. So, so this is a sort of diagram of, of why we're interested in this. So basically, you can think about two things here. One is the target of, of your drug, so the thing that your drug actually binds to and does something to in the body, and that's usually a protein, okay? We're not going to lower cholesterol by gene editing 500 variants across the genome in everybody who has high cholesterol, right? Um, and the pharmaceutical and biotech industries are very good at making drugs that interfere with a particular protein. Uh, and, and then there's the disease that you're trying to treat. And it turns out that most potential drugs fail to treat the intended indication, but this is only discovered after <coughs> clinical trials, which have involved, if you're very lucky, hundreds, more likely thousands or tens of thousands of patients. It's a very long time between actually developing the molecule and doing those clinical trials. Large numbers of patients are treated with a drug in a clinical trial, which turns out to confer no benefit to them. It's a massive waste of their time. It exposes them to all sorts of risks. It's also extremely expensive, and a lot of time and money that could have been put into some other project is basically wasted. Now, these genetic variants, the DNA sequence differences, we can find lots of them, and we know that they're associated with a, a given disease. And because this is genetics, we know that there's no reverse causation, and basically there's not really much confounding either. So we know that not only is this an association, but this is a causal effect from the genetic difference to the indication. Now, if we were very, very lucky, we'd be in a situation like the one with age-related molecular degeneration, where the genetic variant in question actually changes an amino acid in a particular protein, and we could say we knew what it did. Uh, and then we would basically argue by and we could say, well, we know this genetic variant does something to this protein, and it also does something to this disease. Therefore, if we make a drug which has a bigger effect on the same protein, we can hope that it will have a big effect on the same disease. And the critical point is you then have to use this information to basically decide which projects to pursue and which projects not to pursue. If the drug discovery has already started and the company who is developing the drug is hell-bent on pursuing that, and I've actually been in this situation. You can show them all the genetic data you want. Um, the genetic data doesn't change the outcome of the clinical trials, right? What, the only way to make a difference is to actually persuade a drug development company to terminate this project or prioritize that project. So not only doing statistics, but also kind of making that intelligible to the people who are in charge of terminating whole projects, telling whole teams of scientists, well, you thought this was a great idea, but basically you have to stop work on that and work on something else is important as well. Um, so this is a diagram that might be a little bit difficult to see with the bright lights at the front. This is the kind of easiest case. This is a kind of zoom in of that photo I showed you earlier. 
the disease is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in UK biobank. Uh, and the ideal situation you might want to be in, so then basically this is that association statistic you get, zoomed in for a little tiny region of the genome, and basically each point here is one genetic variant. And there's a sort of key here, so symbols which are drawn as blue diamonds are changes are variants that cause a change in protein sequence, and red circles are one that, that don't. Um, and in this particular case, the strongest signal is a variant in a gene called TNS1, and it changes protein sequence. So you might be fairly confident in saying, well, we, we know that this is the genetic variant which is actually causally responsible because it's the one with the strongest association, we hope, and it does something to this protein, therefore this is a potentially interesting drug target for treating this disease. Unfortunately, a small minority of um, phenotype genomic region combinations are like this. The vast majority are more like this, where all of the stronger associations are red circles. I apologize that you can't really see the difference between red circles and blue diamonds here. There's a little blue diamond down here. Um, and basically, this is only showing some kind of association because it's correlated with these other nearby genetic variants. So you have to kind of work out what's going on here. And it turns out that molecular biology in the way that that these other non-protein coding genetic variants exert their effects is incredibly complicated. It's almost the exact opposite of this kind of simple linear additive model that Fisher envisaged, right? These genetic variants here probably, um, you know, control how much some other protein binds to the DNA sequence in this region here, which causes the DNA to fold round um, and interact in some way with something that happens, you know, over here somewhere, which turns on or off some gene that's over here, right? But that's the normal situation. Um, so just to kind of fast forward a bit to the last thing, um, what's become very important here are a set of very simple sort of Bayesian inference tools. So within a given region of the genome, first of all we need to know what the causal variant is and, and secondly what it does. Um, and our starting point here really is to assume that within one region of the genome there's only one variant which is actual, actually causal, so that's a kind of sparsity assumption. So what we need to do is compare some non-nested models, so a model where the phenotype depends only on the first genetic variant, versus a model where the phenotype only depends on the second genetic variant and not the first one. And the point is these models are non-nested. Right? So there's no frequentist procedure that I'm aware of which enables us to make any kind of sane comparison and decide which of these models fits best. So we're completely reliant on Bayesian tools, that's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing. Um, what we want to do is obtain a posterior probability for each of these models, which is the probability that the eye genetic variant is causal, and it turns out that that posterior is very well approximated using the frequentist regression coefficients and standard errors. Basically, you're using a Laplace integration around the peak of the likelihood function. Um, there's a very important extension to two phenotypes. Um, so if one of the phenotypes is the disease you're interested in, and the second phenotype is the expression of some nearby gene, okay, then what you want, to, um, so basically you can have data on the expression level of the gene, so the amount of RNA, for any given gene in any given tissue sample, and that's been kind of measured as extensively now, especially a project called GTEx. Uh, and the important point here is that the identity of the causal variant is actually a nuisance parameter that we want to integrate out. So the question is, it's a kind of two-dimensional question, it's which variant is causal for the disease, which variant is causal for gene expression, okay, and you can write down a posterior probability for any of those combinations in a big square. And what you want to know is, are they the same? which is the sum along the diagonal, or are they not the same, which is the sum of all the off-diagonal terms. Um, and there's also extensions to multiple causal variants, which could be correlated with each other within one region, and that's an area of very widespread current research activity. Um, that, this was, I was going to talk about the localization, but I'm kind of running out of time. Um, the last thing I want to say is, what's, what I think is really important, and probably the most sort of open area, really, is, so coming back to that diagram I showed you before, there's been a lot of sort of activity focusing on can we test whether this genetic variant that affects this disease is associated or, or, or changes expression of that, that gene. But remember that we're kind of arguing by analogy, so we're saying we know this genetic variant affects this disease and it also affects this molecular trait, this protein sequence or the level of this gene in this tissue or something like that. Actually what we really need to know is not only does the genetic variant affect the level of this gene in this tissue, but also what else does it do? Right? If it does 10 other things at the same time, that's actually the norm. Right? Maybe that's the level of another gene in another tissue, then we're not really sure that the first thing we looked at is the right drug target.
So, so the most important thing to bear in mind is really that in any of these approaches, you not only have to look at you know, the tissue that you thought was relevant and perhaps the gene that you were hoping would be implicated, but you have to have some kind of matrix like this, which in some way has some, in this case, it's a posterior probability. And I've looked at expression in a, a large number of tissues and a large number of genes, and basically the, um, this is a heat plot of those posterior probabilities, and this is the new normal, right? There's one genetic variant, it's associated with one disease, but it seems to affect expression of this gene in these three tissues, this gene in these three tissues, another gene in another tissue, and another gene in another tissue. And, and, and this is probably the most, the biggest challenge we have at the moment is we have absolutely no framework for how to interpret these other than some sort of informal, ah, mm, oh, look at this heat plot, is there lots of red all in one column? Um, so I think at the moment, at least for me, that's the biggest, the, the biggest inference challenge we have. Um, so just to summarize what I've told you, um, so GWAS isn't the only area of genetics and statistics, but it's, it's an area of massive activity at the moment. It's finally tens, probably hundreds of thousands of associations between genetic variants, sequence differences, and human diseases and medically relevant traits. Um, the assumptions of Fisher's 1918 infinitesimal model turn out to be a really good approximation to reality and motivate or justify this mixed model approach, which will be increasingly important as we enter an era of basically sequencing whole populations, like all of Finland or all of Iceland or all of um, Estonia. The, the messy reality of molecular biology, I don't really know what else to call it, <laughs> makes it very difficult to infer the causal mechanism, so from the genetic variant to the disease, some of these Bayesian approaches that I very, very briefly talked about show considerable promise. Um, and the last thing I just want to point out is that there are some very well-defined statistical, mathematical, or computational problems like you know, design a Monte Carlo sampler that samples over some complicated model space of which variant is causal or which sets of variants are causal. They're very, very well-defined mathematically and statistically, and they attract a lot of attention. Uh, and lots of people think that they're important and you know, very diligently work on making those Monte Carlo samplers more efficient. <laughs> Sometimes they don't answer the most important scientific questions, which again is a kind of reference back to Fisher as both a statistician but also a scientist who really understood what the important questions were. Toby's talked very nicely about um, traditional genome-wide association studies, um, which kind of started off with studies where you took a set of individuals where you knew their status for a single disease, are they a case or a control, you look at their genotypes across millions or some number of, of genetic variants, you, look, you do this across a few thousand individuals or tens of thousands of individuals, and you ask <coughs> which genotypes are associated with which disease. This is a sort of mostly genotype-based thing, the, the technology is around looking at DNA. You can kind of think of the DNA technology that we use, and I'm not going to go into detail for, as essentially a microscope for looking at a particular part of the genome, um, be, that, <coughs> be that DNA, um, either looking at kind of individual genes or across the entire genome. But the same magnifying glass can actually be used to look at anything, anything where you can read nucleic acids, you can measure something about the genome. Um, Toby again talked about, about um, RNA. So a DNA is made into RNA, this turns on the gene and causes it to be expressed and make a protein and actually do something. And you can use this, this technology to measure the amount of the gene that's being made in some particular cell type. You can also go outside the gene itself and use this technology to read transcription factor binding, which is looking at how proteins are actually binding to the DNA itself in order to turn on or off the expression of particular genes. And you can even look at more of these kind of complex epigenetic measures where, for example, you look at open chromatin. So you use the technology to say, is this DNA wrapped up or unwrapped? Is it, is it open? Is it being actively regulated? These kind of epigenetic measures allow us to say something about the regulation of these genes. Um, so we, this allows us, this kind of, this has kind of led to people going from measuring a simple phenotype to measuring a lot of stuff. You still have your individuals, you still have your genotypes, you may measure gene expression in 20,000 genes across a couple of cell types. You might measure epigenetics across the same cell type, look at their, whether the histones are open or not. You might look at proteins in their, in their blood or in particular cell types, and metabolites may be byproducts of metabolism. And also with things like the biobanks, you can look at full medical records with thousands of phenotype data via healthcare linkage or self-reported stuff. And you may do this in, in small numbers of individuals, a few hundred, you might do it in the thousands of a traditional GWAS, you might go up to millions of, um, of a big biobank, or you might do it in three people as part of a pilot, pilot experiment. So we've gone from measuring something 
quite specific to measuring everything. Let's try and measure everything we can about these individuals and say how does genetics impact the entire space of human phenotype. So that kind of raises the question of what are we trying to learn when we do these experiments? For a traditional GWAS, it's quite straightforward. Which genetic variants correlate with our case control status, our phenotype of interest? For a post-GWAS study, we're interested in a slightly larger set of things. There's the, the, the kind of genetics question immediately, which genetic variants correlate with which phenotypes. But there are also the kind of the causal questions like Toby was talking about, about which phenotypes are correlated or causally related to each other, and what can genetics tell us about that? And there's also the kind of ultimate question, um, can we reconstruct the path from genotype through to phenotype? So can we go from genotype to gene regulation, to gene expression, to protein levels, to disease? That raises some challenges. As, kind of, as Toby said again, genetics is quite simple. Um, variants across different parts of the genome tend to be uncorrelated, which really cuts down the complexity of your model. They're independent predictors. Um, genetics doesn't change over time, and it doesn't change in response to other phenotypes. It's not the case that I've got a lot of Gs at this point because I got fat. And likewise, confounding a genetics is quite easy to handle. It's based on these quite simple relatedness measures. When you start going into high dimensional phenotypes where you measure everything, it gets a lot harder. So you need to handle confounding, reverse causality, so where one phenotype is in, um, impacting a, where there's a correlation due to a phenotype that's impacting something at a lower level. Your disease state is impacting your gene expression, for example. Um, mediation or temporal changes in phenotype, things have changed between measures. You have to account for that. We have these high dimensional <coughs> problems where um, because our sample, because our models grow quite fast with the number of phenotypes, you can have cases where your, the number of phenotypes becomes larger than your sample size. The number of um, uh, uh, parameters in your model become larger than the sample size. And this can even extend to kind of non-identifiable models that I'll get to in a bit. I'm going to give a couple of examples now of how you analyze these kind of data and how statistics and genetics have kind of interplayed in this. The first one is quite a simple one. It's where um, some simple statistical methods of how we measure variance and how we do um, uh, uh, significant testing has impacted the way we can do small sample um, size studies that we couldn't do before. And then there's a slightly more involved one where an application in genetics has driven some statistical methodology and some new statistical results. So, the large P, small n problem. We have a large number of parameters, a small number of samples. What's an example of that? So suppose we come up with some new technology for measuring some function, of ge some gene function. We measure something using DNA, extra we extract some DNA, we sequence it, we measure something about the function of the genome. What we'll often start by doing is running this experiment on a small number of individuals, three individuals, five individuals, that we put through some experimental assay. If they're immune cells, you might expose them to a pathogen, for example. And then we ask which genes are turned on as a way of validating that our technology is doing the kind of thing we wanted to do in the conditions that we're looking at. Now the problem here is that we're, look, we're testing three individuals and we're looking genome-wide, so we're going to be looking at 20,000 or more genes. So this is a, a kind of stereotypical large P, small n problem. So let's say that we've run this on <coughs> something that we kind of believe is a, is a, is a gene that's important. Um, you might measure this gene, ex this gene expression and find that in your null condition, it's these red dots kind of below, and after stimulation it seems to go up. I mean, that's kind of consistent with what's what we'd like to see. However, if you run a statistical test on this, um, standard frequentist t-test, you get a p-value that's small, but it doesn't pass from for any um, correction. It doesn't, um, it's not significant after testing multiple, cor multiple correction. Um, and what's going on here is that it's consistent with the sort of what we want to be true, i.e. Um, small variance distributions that shifted up by our experimental condition. Um, but it's also consistent with a very large distribution that encompasses this entire range, and just by chance, we've got a few up here and a few down here. And if you run 20,000 genes, you'll find some cases where you have a few up here and a few down here, and you can't actually say this is, this is due to our treatment effect. <coughs> um, suppose that we knew what the actual true underlying variance was. Suppose we knew that the variance wasn't massive. We'd be able to run this test much more powerfully and say, ah, here's the kind of confidence interval based on our known variance. We can run a simple z-test, and we get something that's very significant, and that's, you know, we managed to find the thing we want to find. However, we don't know the variance. When you're running a new experiment, you don't know what the um, variance will be. But we can take advantage of the fact that we haven't just run this once. We've run this on 20,000 genes. And so what we have is a distribution of observed variances. Um, this is a bit noisy because it's a combination of the true underlying distribution of variances and the sampling error of the variance itself but it's not that hard to deconvolute them and come up with some estimate of the underlying distribution of variances in, our, in this experiment. Um, we can now do all the things that you statisticians will do with this. You can treat it as a prior. 
if you believe it's well estimated. Um, you can use it as a, as, a, as a random effect in a random effect model. Um, and actually, that can really, we call, the, we call this as a, a variance stabilization because it sucks the variance into what we, towards what we expect. And you generate some new confidence intervals. This is from a, from a mixed model. Um, and you end up with a p-value that's, that's significant after correct, correction um, and doesn't involve making any assumptions. It all comes from kind of empirical Bayesian approach. So this allows us, and in this kind of toy example, it allows us to achieve the um, correct, significance correction for the number of genes 70% of the time in this example when it would have been less than 5% of the time if we didn't stabilize the variance. In practice, this is not as simple as I made it seem, this toy example. Um, real data isn't normally distributed. You can't use sort of standard t-tests and things. Um, but um, there are models where we can look at <coughs> recount sequence data as an over-dispersed gamma Poisson. And you also need to account for things like there's a relationship between the expression of a gene and the variance. So things that are expressed less tend to vary more. Um, and you also need to take into account there are some outliers. But people have developed these techniques and they apply them. And this is how people do pilot experiments, small sample size experiments here. The state of the art being this DEC2 method, which was developed for RNA sequencing, but is now used for epigenetics and a load of other stuff. OK. Um, that's our simple problem. To go into something that's slightly more involved. I'm going to kind of build up this sort of this kind of history of, of, of um, genetic association as of these kind of graphical models. So a simple GWAS is you have a genotype that has an impact on a phenotype. It's a single univariate genotype, single unitary phenotype. Obviously, you run it millions of times, but it's essentially just a simple test run over and over again. Um, standard methods, standard regression methods, logistic regression, linear regression work perfectly well. You need to be powered and use the right correction, but it's, it's all relatively straightforward. There's the kind of polygenic thing where we want to test lots of different effects of genotypes on a single phenotype, um, <coughs> which is kind of what also Toby was kind of talking about here. Um, and you, but this is also quite easy. You either do it as a big linear model where you have lots of predictors, and still the sample of, there isn't that many parameters, and you can fit it with a reasonable sample size. If there's lots and lots of genotypes, then you can start doing these linear mixed models or, or, or apply REML to, to get a kind of estimate where you treat these as random effects. It's still quite straightforward. However, if instead of expanding the number of genotypes to expand the number of phenotypes, everything gets a lot more complicated. Um, your number of parameters now becomes, um, you need to take into account the correlation structure and the covariance structure between all these phenotypes. I thought you can't quite see my equation here, but basically you model this as a linear model with some, a multivariate normal model with a, um, a variance or a precision matrix, and you need to estimate this, this precision matrix, which is number of phenotypes by number of phenotypes, um, as that grows, um, it becomes a higher dimensional problem and it becomes very hard to fit. Um, to go to kind of a, a, an even more complicated one, this is the one that we're kind of quite interested in, is that as well as having multiple phenotypes, you also have a lot of unobserved phenotypes. This is the confounding we talk about. You know, you may have measured a load of phenotypes in the one, but you may not have measured their weight or their activity levels or some other unknown confounder that you haven't even measured. And when you do these analyses, you need to account for the possibility that these confounders are out there. You need to integrate out these possible underlying confounders. And that generates this model, again, which is a little bit hard to see. Um, we have a covariance matrix that consists of the direct relationships between phenotypes, but also the confounding relationship between phenotypes. Uh, and this is, becomes more of a problem because you now have a covariance matrix that has more parameters than the size of the covariance matrix. Um, you have a non-identified problem where you can fit different values of the confounding and the relationship between phenotypes that produce exactly the same covariance matrix, and so you can't actually tell the difference between these using data alone. The whole thing falls down. So how do we kind of get around these? How do we solve these problems? Um, the standard we're doing, especially for, for the, for, so I'm sure that a lot of people have encountered for the lasso, and in particular the graphical lasso, where you use a penalizer likelihood. So you take your standard likelihood, your data likelihood, and then you add some penalization factor when you minimize it that enforces something you want to enforce. Um, so in this case, we use the L1 norm. Well, if people use the L1 norm, um, this is um, uh, enforces that there aren't. This enforces an assumption of sparsity. I uh, you have lots of phenotypes, but most of them don't directly impact one another. Um, they uh, they are, if they're correlated, they're due to some an indirect effect. Um, you this L1 penalty is, is, the, is the convex envelope of um, of the density, and it's quite easy to solve, and you can, you can optimize it using standard complex optimization techniques, and it's consistent and recovers the right graphical models and allows you to actually learn these graphical models in a computationally efficient way. So um, via a number of other researchers, and they're actually finishing up with, um, with a, a PhD student, Ben Frott, 
we um, uh, developed a new method to extend these penalized likelihood approaches um, to have a more complicated model where we have a conditional genotypes affect phenotypes. We also have um, uh, confounding, and we also have underlying shared genetic pathways. So we have genotypes that affect confounders, which then affect phenotypes. Um, and this kind of this manages to kind of build in most of the kind of um, things that are problems with that that make it difficult to infer things. Um, this is highly non-identified. It has lots of parameters, but we can come up with a, a penalized likelihood where we look at the likelihood, um, and then we penalize it with a sparse component. So this is an L1 penalty on um, the effect between phenotypes. So the, these green lines, we make sure there aren't that many effects, direct effects between phenotypes, and we also make sure there aren't that many direct effects between genotypes and phenotypes. And that's one set of it. Um, but we also have another term for the effect of the covariance matrix of these underlying factors. And those we penalize to be of low rank using this nuclear norm, the nuclear norm being the, the convex envelope of the rank. Um, and uh, there we enforce that, the, that there, aren't, there is a large number of confounders of the phenotypes and there aren't a large number of pathways. And basically under certain assumptions, essentially that providing it's sparse enough and there are a small enough number of confounders, we can produce an identified, consistent, well-powered model that outperforms other things and can be applied quite neatly. Um, so, and that's now been published in JASA, if anyone wants to read it. Um, it's quite, got some quite nice applications in it, if you like applications. Uh, just a different application to that in the paper. So I'm interested in, in immune variation. Um, this is a sort of study we did um, in collaboration with, with scientists called Ben Fairfax in Oxford, where we took healthy volunteers, we measured their genotypes using standard techniques. We isolated cells <coughs> from them, and then we stimulated them using a, 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 a signal, an immune signaling molecule to sort of simulate an immune response. And then we measured what signaling molecules this cell cells produce. So what signals did they give off? Um, and then we applied our method, our, um, our penalized likelihood method to this. If you just do a basic let, look at the correlations between things, everything, every single immune mo signaling molecule is correlated with every other immune signaling molecule. You have a massive hairy hairball, and this is all due to confounding and things. If we do um, um, a graphical lasso, which um, enforces sparsity but doesn't control for the, um, the confounding, it doesn't really work. It still produces a very large number of correlations, the vast majority which is spurious. Using our techniques, you can produce a kind of quite a much, a, a much neater network that's much less dense and sort of recapitulates all the problems. And if you do a little extra playing where you only look at those correlations which are really high confidence, you end up recovering a small number of quite neat immune um, signaling pathways. All right, I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, there are some, a lot. There are still a lot more, and um, techniques. That, sorry, what was that? Five minutes. Okay. There are still a lot more um, uh, techniques that we that need to be developed, and that some of this is techniques that statisticians need to develop. Some of it is techniques that we as geneticists need to start applying. Um, some of this is perhaps exciting applications for the methods you've all developed. So one thing is, is, is around non-parametrics, and in particular, non-parametrics for high-dimensional non-Gaussian data. All of the stuff I showed you before assumes you have one big multivariate normal, which obviously isn't true. If you go to something like the UK Biobank, what you have is some weird complex network where genetics impacts a bunch of phenotypes, which are things like, do you smoke? What's the number of times you've broken a bone in your leg? Um, how many units of alcohol do you consume in a week? How many reads have we observed of gene X? Um, these are highly heterogeneous, they're often discrete, um, they're non-normally distributed. There's no particular reason to think that even if you project these back on, if you normalize these back onto a normal scale, that the effects will be linear. Um, and what we really need is non-parametric methods where we can actually fit these models to this data that still keeps all the information and all the scale that's implicit to it. Um, we're also, and I know that there was a session yesterday about this kind of thing, um, we need a lot more good tools for analyzing sparse, <coughs> censored, high-dimensional time series data. And by that, what I really mean is medical records. So if you think that this is someone's medical record over a number of, a, a few years, every circle is the time they've encountered someone in the healthcare system. They've had some blood pressure measures, which have been done at more or less random times. Some subset of the time, um, they've had um, uh, um, some sort of blood test, which measures their um, inflammatory response. They've also got a load of just flags. They were diagnosed with lung cancer here, but they weren't. Um, but they didn't have it here. It went into remission for a while. They received some chemotherapy. They've been seeing a doctor repeatedly for rheumatoid arthritis, and occasionally gets given anti-TNF to treat it. 
Um, you can combine this across hundreds of thousands of people with genotype data, and you can ask simple things like, does this associate with rheumatoid arthritis? What we'd really like to know is, how does it affect our health profile as a whole? How does it affect how we age? How does it affect how things change over time? And for that, we really need good time series models that can handle all this missing data. And related to that, we really need tools that can scale to biobank scale, hundreds of thousands of people, tens of millions or more observations, um, and we need tools that are usable and explainable to non-statisticians. 